All right, folks, Steve Grumbine, the Rogue Scholar. My guest today is one of my good friends, Professor Steve Keen. We're going to be talking about his book, The New Economics of Manifesto. And he had been working on this for some time, talked to him about it when he was writing it, and we didn't get a chance to talk about it for you all. In fact, this is the first time he's been on the Rogue Scholar because the Rogue Scholar is only a couple weeks old. Previously, you had heard all of our interviews on macro and cheese. So without further ado, let me bring on my good friend and guest, Professor Steve Keen. Welcome to the show, sir. Good to be here, Matt. It's worth to have a talk about the technical hassles I've had. That's it uh, going on the book as well. Well, I, I think I want to let everyone know that this is not just any old interview. You woke up at the insane crack of dawn to be on my show, and I feel tremendously <laughs> honored. Yeah, yeah. But on the early side over here. <laughs> I, I love you. I love you so much. Thank you so much <laughs> for doing this for me. But listen, this, this book, I, you know, I, I told you beforehand, I have not had a chance to read the entire thing, but yeah. I did read quite a bit of it. I kind of went through each chapter to kind of get an understanding of where you were going with this, and I highlighted a few things. But what I wanted to do was really just give you an opportunity to explain what was the book about and mm. what was the motivation behind doing it. And then we'll get into some of the details with Nordhaus and Krugman yeah. and all the other uh, usual suspects. Okay. Well, I've got to say that I have to thank my publisher, uh, uh, George Owens, for, who's a, a publisher at uh, Polity Press, because George initially invited me to write a book which is called Economic Matters Because, and it was supposed to be a book for school students about why they should study economics, to which I said, you know, you're, I'm not the right person for that. I think he really was just, he wanted me to write what you might call a mini manifesto, what I think economics should be, not uh, not what it is at the moment. And that's what's finally evolved. So it's it's uh, very concise. It's 25,000 words, uh, but it goes through what I see is what the foundations of economics should be. And... Uh, in, in this sense, I agree with the neoclassicals on one thing and only one thing, that economics needs incontrovertible foundations in the same way that physics has that chemistry, biology, and so on, the, the genuine science. There's a foundation nobody can dispute. The trouble is they've gone from the wrong end. They've started from microeconomics and they've built their foundation that way, and that's all they believe you can do. And in fact, if you, you know their foundation well, everything in the microeconomics is nonsense, empirically wrong, logically wrong, and so on and so forth. And they wave their hands about all that and build this you know, huge edifice on a pyramid that is actually upside down. And when I say we, we can actually start from literally from macroeconomics itself, you define the macroeconomy in terms of employment rates, income distribution, debt shares, which is what the non-neoclassicals non like you and me bring in that the neoclassicals ignore. And those three terms alone, you get Minsky's financial instability hypothesis when you put it into uh, into uh, dynamic rather than simply a set of definitions. So you can build economics from the ground up. You don't need all the micro nonsense, which is which is where economics retreats to every time it fails, which is what's happening now at the mainstream after the global financial crisis. They've gone back to micro, hide for a while and come back out again. And then to be a true foundation, it must be integrated with uh, the ecology. The economy is a subset of the ecology, a fully owned subset of the of the biosphere of the planet. So you must include that as well. And that actually takes us back to the physiocrats, who were the last people to do it properly. And before we got involved in the value wars over, you know, whether labor or capital or both together or utility was the source of value. So I go back and show how you can bring energy in properly. Uh, and of course, it has to be a monetary system. And to do that, that's why I built my software package, Minsky, which unfortunately, for technical reasons, I won't be able to show this morning. We'll talk about that in a tick. Um, and so I've, I've built a framework for an integrated approach to economics uh, that starts from energy, uh, basically sees GDP as useful work, turns from the energy we find for free in the universe into stuff we can exploit. When I saw the gear lying behind you there. Um, and this is going to cause an ecological catastrophe because we have well and truly exceeded the physical bounds of the planet. And one of the major reasons why we've done that is because of neoclassical economists who've trivialized the dangers of climate change. So I go into great detail. And whereas in the past with debunking economics and say, this is all the stuff you should not believe in what you're taught, my final line in this book is uh, that neoclassical economics is a threat 
not merely to the existence of capitalism, but perhaps to even the existence of human civilization in general. It has to go. Steve, I, first of all, let me just say you're a man of my own heart, because obviously I think one of the most important aspects of my attraction to you and your work is the fact that you don't mess around. You, you are willing to name names and you're willing to call murder, murder. You're willing to call destruction, destruction. You don't patty yeah. cake around with all the, uh, you know, don't get me wrong. You're a polite gentleman. You're a smart man. But when you come to saving lives, you're not afraid to point out, hey, mm. this is dangerous. This is deadly. And it that is to deadly. me is, that makes you right up there in the top wrong, man. I really love your work. I really, really Thank do. You. I want to read something from Kate Rawworth on the back of your book that I felt like was really kind of cheeky and awesome, awesome in the same breath. Yeah. yeah, she says, uh, in this punchy and passionate book, Steve Keen deftly unravels the fundamentals of neoclassical economics and then starts to weave together the mindset models and maths of an economics that actually works for a student of economic modeling who wants to help create tools that are uh, fit for the 21st century. This is the handbook and call to action you have been waiting for. Kate Rawworth, author of Donut Economics. And, you know, you had made mention of many of the things, like I said previously, in your book, in other podcasts that we have done through Macro and Cheese, uh, which is the flagship of my work. I, I think we're up to 155 uh, episodes now, and you've been at least three or four of those 155. <laughs> and every one of your podcasts, every one of our talks, I learn something new and different each time. One of the things that I really point to with you, and I know that you're not the father of this. This is stuff that used to be known that had been forgotten and you're trying to bring yeah. back. And that is the role of energy. I've talked about soil depletion and things like that. Jason mm. Hickel talks a lot about that as well. Um, but the idea of having energy baked in as a real element to understanding economics and modeling I think is vital, especially as we, you know, a movie like Don't Look Up comes out, we get to yeah. watch a, a comet fall from the sky. But but we have real things going on right here, right now, that require us to re rethink how we approach economics. And I believe that you have captured that in this book. And having talked to you, I kind of know a lot more about what's in this book than is written. Mm. What are your thoughts in terms of the lack of adoption in energy? into economics field why, why do you suppose the average don't even touch this it's it's really because once you get a mental framework the mental framework is what you see as reality it's it's no longer um you know you, you, you're, the reality is out there and we're trying to get a handle on it by modeling it um but by making a conceptual framework for it. But once we've done that, the conceptual framework takes over. And what we understand is not the economy itself, but our conceptual framework about the economy. Now, if you go back against, like you go back in history uh, and you go to the physiocrats, who were the uh, really the very first school of economic thought, they originated in France. And in France, which was an overwhelmingly agricultural nation compared not just to England, but particularly to Scotland, which is where economics, classical economics truly began with Adam Smith. And the physiocrats was looking at an agricultural society so that if you plant one corn seed, you get a plant later with a thousand corn seeds in it, some of which you can eat, some of which you put aside, put aside, and then you can therefore, you know, grow more corn as well as feed yourself. And out of that, they had a vision that this true source of, of, of wealth was the land. And the way they expressed it was the free gift of nature. Now, their work predated the actual invention of the term energy by uh, up to 100 years. The, it was, the word energy was first designed by an English polymath, I think called Taylor, in 1809. Uh, so they predated energy. But what they said was, effectively, uh, all wealth comes from energy. Now, along comes Adam Smith from industrial you know, Scotland. Uh, it, 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 when he was a tutor there, taking a, a young uh, member of the royalty, uh, to France for his part of his education, met with Canet, who was the leading physiocrat, and read Book of Cantillon and so on. And he transformed it to say, labor is the source of all wealth, the division of labor and so on. 
And Leninji therefore dropped out of the picture right back in 1776. And, in, and we have all this battle of no, it's, it's labor, labor is a source of all value, it's Marx's position, neocapitals come along, it's utility maximization. Uh, and, and we have these value wars for really about a quarter of a millennium, 250 years almost, of this nonsense, leaving out energy. And uh, in the real world, when you look, when you start from the point of view of physics, nothing can be produced without energy. So there have been a, a side set of economists, particularly a guy called Robert Ayers, who's a good friend of mine, uh, who's a physicist who's trying to bring energy into economic theory. And when working with Bob uh, one day in his, in his house, I just suddenly, which is full of statues, I, I, I came upon the logical way you can bring energy in from the very foundation. And that is that when, when economists try to handle energy, they tack it on as another what they call factor of production. So neoclassicals have technology times labor times capital uh, and raise to a power so you get a, a constant returns to scale. And they simply tack energy on the end. And then they say the power you raise energy to is roughly the three or 4% of GDP that you can attribute to energy. Uh, when I had this little brainwave, it was simply labor without energy is a corpse. Capital without energy is a sculpture. And when you plead that in logically, what it means is energy is an input to both labor and capital without which they can perform no work. Now, even when you feed that into the standard production function that neoclassicals use, the Cobb-Douglas production function, that raises the exponent from the energy from 0 0.03, roughly, to 0 0.3, which is the same as they use for capital. Then if you uh, take a look at it from the point of view of uh, actually work of Gregory Mankiw. I came a comp complimenting Gregory Mankiw on a paper he wrote back in 95 on energy. Uh, he says the coefficient for capital shouldn't be 0.3, it should be 0.8 when you do international comparisons. That's almost one. And that comes up with Leontiev. And what you fundamentally end up saying is labor uh, output is energy transformed into useful work. And then when you do that, because some of your energy must be wasted, again, by the laws of thermodynamics, you have waste both matter and energy dumped into the biosphere. So right from the very foundation, we are aware there are physical limits to the planet, both in terms of we, we must have energy as an input and also matter, of course, otherwise we can't have GDP. And then when we do that, what we end up doing is polluting the biosphere, we, it's in, inevitable. So that, that integrates economics and ecology right from the day one. And we would never have ended up in the situation we're in now if we'd done that. And of course, what Hackman, you know this from reading that chapter of the book, in William Nordhaus, in his uh, attempt to grapple with climate, ends up saying that 87% of the economy will be unaffected by climate change <laughs> because it happens in carefully controlled environments, otherwise indoors. The only thing that manufacturing, services, mining, he included as well, government activity, the only thing they have in common, have got a roof over them. So a roof over your head will protect you from climate change. And he actually said at one point, it's very hard to see any effects of uh, climate change or global warming on mining, manufacturing, services, government in the next 50 to 75 years. Now, what he doesn't realise is you can't do any of that without energy. So right from the outset, it's madness. But because of that madness, uh, we have ignored the damage we've done to the climate in the last 50 years since the limits to growth made much the same insights. And we are now facing an ecological catastrophe. And I can lay it firmly at the door of neoclassical economics because no other discipline, no other subset of economics would ever have let this stuff get published. And yet that's dominated our policy response for the last half century, which is why we face a calamity this, this century. Well, you know, you, you talk a bit about Krugman and you talk a bit about the other neo uh, Keynesians or new Keynesians um, mm. and, and some of their modeling, right? And you started this podcast out saying, hey, we got to have a foundation a mathematical yeah. foundation for this economic theory to, to really make it hold up. And you see these folks using ISLM and you see them using DSGE and they have this representative mm -hmm. agent and they're all fraudulent. They're, none of them represent anything remotely real. And yet they hold on to these things. This is filled in the Academy. Every peer reviewed mm -hmm. article, every peer reviewed journal, every classroom teaches this garbage. And, and people come out and they're robots to produce nonsense, mysticism, very, very bad economics. Um, mm. How did you 
get to analyzing those while simultaneously coming up with your modeling. I mean, Minsky is taking you some time to create. I mean, I remember two years ago, you talking about this. Yeah. So talk to me about the, uh, first of all, talk about the representative agent, the DSGE <laughs> and ISLM models real quick. You don't have to go into detail. This is all joke basically, but yeah. explain it because people will run into it and then explain yeah. the thinking behind Minsky. Okay. Well, the, the, the neoclassical modeling really believes you've got to start from microeconomics and work your way up. And uh, so, we, we, Mac, in fact, if you look at the, the neoclassical history, they began in 1870, and they, uh, there, were, there were two major strands to it, in a sense. There was the idea of uh, consumers being utility maximizers and firms being profit maximizers, and that led through Jevons to Marshall, and that's the sort of indirect affecting supply and demand curve stuff that you know the first year textbooks the other was volra and volra was we've got to have more time for volra in this sense he said we need a model that explains not just one market but interacting markets so he dreamt up this idea of a uh, based on the paris stock exchange or bourse the uh, commodity exchange in paris where in every part of the commodity exchange, so flowers and gold and pigs and so on there would be a auctioneer whose role was to ensure equilibrium was reached in that individual market between supply of pigs and demand for pigs. You'd start at yesterday's price. Uh, you'd then there'd be uh, you'd add up the sum number of pigs being demanded and being uh, supplied at that price, and jiggle the price up or down until those two are equal. Now, what Valro said was, well, can we do this for the whole economy? Can we have one big room where all the people turn up? all the pigs and flowers and gold and so on, and we have a random set of prices, and maybe yesterday's prices, and we do the same thing, and we don't allow trade to occur until every last market is in equilibrium. That's general equilibrium. Now, that's the seductive vision of, the, of, an, of a market economy functioning as a perfect system that became ingrained in the minds of, of ne the early neoclassical economists. That was the technical challenge. Now, ironically, in the early, uh, 19th, in the early 20th century, uh, two mathematicians solving a, a very strong problem in pure mathematics proved that, and this is going to sound technical, I'll leave it at the technical level, the dominant eigenvalue of a, a positive semi-definite matrix is positive. What the hell does that mean? When you apply it to economics, what it says is if you try to make up an array of inputs and outputs, well, you're using goods as inputs to produce goods as outputs, um, then the way that that iterative process that God Loris described stretches space, uh, actually moves away from the equilibrium. You won't get there. It's unstable. Now, at that point, what neoclassicals, once they realised the mathematics in the early 60s, it took them that long to realise this mathematical result, should have been, oh, dear, well, prices can't be equilibrium. Break away from equilibrium. Now, because it had been ingrained in their thinking at this stage for about 90 years, they were incapable of doing it. So their first attempt was to say, we have to generalize the mental process involved and even change the minds of the traders. This is actually in a paper from Jorgensen in 1961 or 63, I think. If we want to achieve equilibrium, we have to presume we can change the taste of the agents to reach that outcome. Now that is madness, okay? But because this, this is what happens when you get, a, a concept becomes essential while you also prove that it's wrong, you will leap make intellectual leaps to get over the wrongness and carry on with the concept. And that's that's the genesis way, way back of what are called computable general equilibrium models, which were always unstable and they couldn't quite work out why. This mathematical problem was the reason why. Then in the 70s, you had uh, Lucas come along and say, well, if we try to manage a kind of economy using government policy, people will react to that policy and that will therefore change the parameters and you can't use this array of numbers anyway which was really nice for the neoclassicals. It was going nowhere for them in that sense. So they leapt over to what they called uh, uh, intertemporal equilibrium. And they went back to a model from 1928 from a polymath. Um, uh, uh, this is this is where three o'clock in the morning is a bit too early for me. Um, uh, I can't think of the bloody name all of a sudden. But his, 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 uh, he's a, he's a acolyte of Keynes and highly mathematical person. And his model was of a individual agent what he called and it wasn't a representative agent it was like a what they call a social planner so he, the problem that, that he set himself was is there an optimal savings rate for an economy okay now because he was on output 
as, cons as, as consumption plus investment and have consumption, and they believe neoclassicals believe savings causes investment, then there's, if you change the level of consumption, you also change the level of savings. So that, that's what you have to do. And what uh, this hy hypothesis, and it's <laughs> Ramsey, okay, finally came to be Ramsey's, Ramsey's <laughs> hypothesis was that you could get a uh, equilibrium in the far distant future that he literally called the bliss point, where the bliss point was a combination of the uh, rate of change of, the, of, of utility and the rate of change of capital. And when they were in when the equilibrium, that was the bliss point. Now, that bliss point happened to have the shape of a saddle. Okay. Uh, you can have, if you have two, a dynamic pattern, you can have three, three fundamental shapes. It can be an upside down um, hat. So if you throw a, a ball bearing at it, it'll roll down to the bottom of the hat. It can be a hat of the right way up. You throw a ball bearing at it, it'll slide off the hat. Now, with a saddle, if you're a brilliant, brilliant thrower <laughs> of a ball bearing, you can get it just to run up and down along the spine of the horse on the saddle and slowly fluctuate till it gets to the middle. If you're a human being or any other, other creature, you throw it at the saddle, it's going to slide off the edge. Now, yes. they use that as a feature of the model. And they said, well, <laughs> what that means is there's only this one stable path which we can take from the bliss point and work backwards through time to today and realise that's where we have to be to get the optimal savings rate. So the social planner will tell us, so you've got to consume less or maybe more to get to that bliss point, the, the, the saddle path that would lead to this far distant future bliss point. Now, that was the genesis of the representative agent. And, I mean, at this stage, you are off with the fairies, okay? And it is obsession with equilibrium that leads to this nonsense position. But to do it takes a huge amount of what looks like really complicated mathematics. And they and it ends up with a few set of equations, one of which actually involves the central bank setting interest rates, the so-called Taylor equation. So it puts economists, neoclassical economists, in the centre of the whole bloody thing as adjusting the economy by intelligently working out the uh, whether using their models where this this point is in the future. They don't call it that anymore. They're not quite that stupid. Um, and, but when you know, the, the the jump variable they call consumption has, has has to change instantly. And we all, rather than saying it's a a representative agent that does it they say it's the social planner and now they're trying to generalize it to two agents you know it is just a waste of bloody time from a point of view of anybody who's sensible about mathematics and that's why i call what they do not mathematics but mathematics yeah, this reminds me if you if you remember the movie 300 and the story of thermopylae and all that stuff the yeah. persians and the spartans and all this reminds me of them going up to the the mystics up at the top to beg them to give them permission to go to war and they're sitting mm. there like just that's exactly what economists remind me of not you guys of course not my heterodox yeah, no. friends but these <laughs> other folks that's exactly what they remind me of like some sort of mystics you know with warts all over them lusting over the young girl anyway sorry about that keep going with this because this is the I think this is the important stuff that people will hear about because they won't hear about the heterodox side they will only hear about that's these kind of nonsensical part. things Yes. Yeah. And it, and it, it, be, it, be, it, be, it be, I call it a, it, it's a, it's a mathematically founded religion and it's religion, which has proven it's God doesn't exist, but they just cannot bring themselves to do that. So when they, when they do what they call simplifying assumptions, what they're making is gigantic logical leaps uh, to get over a fundamental flaw in the actual logic. And like another one, which is probably more critical to neoclassicals because uh, talking about utility maximization and consumption is such an essential part of their thinking. To derive a downward sloping market demand curve, you know, the, you know, the, the two lines intersecting in neoclassical thought and the, the demand falls as price, price rises, that fundamental idea. They work on how to derive that using what they call indifference curves, and they then have to do a bit of a modification, which they call Hicksian compensated demand curves. And with a fair bit of mathematics, they can prove that uh, a single individual consumer has a downward sloping, what they call Hicksian compensated demand curve. Now, that's what they teach in micro textbooks. And then bang, you have the market demand curve. Uh, some very good mathematical economists, starting with a guy called Gorman, literally the year I was born, 1953. Jonathan's asked a good question there, by the way. We'll come back to that. 1953, he proved that the only way you could get the market demand curve to have the same slope as the individual's demand curve, or rather to guarantee that it slopes down, 
was that, first of all, and he actually put it this way, the necessary conditions quoted above are intuitively reasonable. It says that an extra dollar of money will be spent the same way no matter to whom it is given. That's not intuitively oh. reasonable. That's intuitively bullshit. That's saying if Bill <laughs> Gates walks past a homeless person and drops a dollar in the cup, that homeless person will spend part of a dollar on buying Leo Donato, Leo Donato's uh, 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 drawings. If, on the other hand, the homeless person gives Bill Gates a dollar for the sheer fun of it, Bill Gates will go and buy some methylated spirits. Now, it's, it's nonsense. But what they found was not only do we all have to have parallel taste, as they call this parallel Engels curve is the technical term for it, they can't change slope with income. And therefore, changing the distribution of income can have no effect on the pattern of demand. Now, that is what I'm saying. They're ruling out the class system because they can't mathematically cope with it. And yet they're not even aware of it. They think this is sophisticated. Is so this, this, this is rife through economic theory. Let, let me let me put myself out there and make a fool of myself momentarily. Is this sort of where praxeology that. comes in? Huh? Is this Sorry? where praxeology kicks in? Yeah, I think it is. It's crass theology. Because, and this is something which it comes down to what humans actually are. Uh, because we think of ourselves as logical creatures and scientists and blah, blah, blah. That's how we built the civilization we live in. But we started fundamentally as, the, as maybe the only, maybe we've got some companions who can share beliefs, uh, but we are a belief-sharing species. We can come up with a belief and then we act on that belief collectively in a way that no other species can do, certainly to the scale that we can. So our success over other species on the planet was due to our capacity to share beliefs and be motivated by them. Now, that is a fundamental poison uh, when you get to the stage where we are as technologically advanced now. Science saves us from us because science goes and tests its belief. And if you have a paradigm that fails a belief in the science, then ultimately that paradigm will be replaced. Um, but in economics, because the tests that come along are events, historical events, rather than uh, experiments that any student can repeat at any time themselves to check, you don't get that generational change. So you, if you have a, a particular cohort that dominate, and the neoclassicals dominate the profession, uh, they can have a crisis like the Great Depression come along. And then in the middle of that, still be talking about utility maximising uh, uh, individuals, profit maximising firms, government being a bad idea, and, uh, and the system reaching equilibrium. And that's, I mean, some of these people invented what are now called real business cycle models actually argued that the Great Depression was caused by an increase in, this, in the desire for leisure by, by workers in the <laughs> 1930s. Uh, so it, the beliefs, the, the, this, the fact that we can't test our beliefs is why I think economics doesn't go through the generational change that it needs whenever it strikes an anomaly. And I've now, like I thought the financial crisis would be the significant event that meant, okay, we'd show there's a flaw there, we have to have change. They went right back to it. They become more rabid in their, in, their, in their theory itself. They still leave money out deliberately. They still think they can do it from representative agents. They still think they've got to work from micro. And, and they exclude and they try to drive out, of course, characters like myself from the profession. So they're worse than they were before the crisis, not better. You know, one of the things that I, I, I want to compliment you on, and this may be gratuitous, but I believe this, mm. a lot of these economists, when they find out new information, when their past ideas have been refuted and debunked, most will not acknowledge that. Most will double down and just continue saying what they've been saying. You're one of the few people who I know that, in your studies, if you find something you got wrong, you'll be the first one to come out and say, hey, got this wrong. I can tell everything that you do. There, there's a sense of integrity. And I think that that's true in the heterodox world as a whole. I mean, I'm sure it's not universal, but I believe hmm. that heterodox it, by its very nature is in pursuit of truth. It's it's really trying to get at the crux of things. And, and you're very much a leading voice. In that. I do want to take a moment because we're coming near the end of this here. I want to read hmm. this particular passage on page 142 of your book. I brought it hmm. up to you offline. 
think this is really important. Bear with me. It's a few seconds, but I'm sure you've heard this before. <laughs> it says, these necessary aspects of a realistic new economics have a paradoxical political outcome. They result from having a fearless agnosticism about ideology and politics. To acknowledge that capitalism is a class system is simply acknowledging a fact. While the neoclassical representative agent, which we just spent time talking about, is a fiction. But they also mean that economics is necessarily political. With a class-based analysis, the consequences for different social classes of different economic policies must be confronted. The distributions of income, wealth, and power matter. And economists can no longer hide behind aggregate cost-benefit analysis when debating policy. I particularly love that point. The new economics must also be grounded in the actual dynamics, complexity, and chaos of capitalism. Though there is nothing political about this, it is simply a case of using the tools of analysis that suit the dynamic evolutionary system that capitalism itself is. I expect that this dynamic foundation will lead to an economics that will be as progressive as the equilibrium foundation of neoclassical economics proved to be reactionary. I think that's just an amazing two paragraphs right there, Steve. And uh, the reason why it matters, and for folks that maybe that, that felt like a word salad because you're not <laughs> looking at it, let me just tell you honestly what, what, what jumps out at me right away. We can hide. You, you know how you see the, the Wall Street doing fantastic right now. You're like, oh, my God, it's perfect. Everything. Look, look, jobs, everything. But that's a lie, right? We know it's a lie because we see our friends suffering. We see our friends not getting mm. teeth filled that are rotting out of their mouth. We see people literally driving cars that have no reverse, so they coast through parking lots to get in the spot. I mean, not to be too particular there, but mm. we see people really, truly struggling. But the aggregate number says, wow, Wall Street's having record profits. It's doing fantastic. Yeah. So the numbers look really good because that's the aggregate. But when you peel it away with a class-based understanding of the behaviors and the needs of each level and what they would do with $1,000, as you kind of laid out, you used a different mm -hmm. number, but you get my point. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is key. We keep trying to lump everything into one thing. And this brings me to my one complaint about what you said. And I don't even know if it's a complaint so much mm -hmm. as to help me clarify. GDP has largely been an indiscriminate number. doesn't really mean anything largely. It could mean anything and everything and nothing at all. And mm -hmm. Kate Raworth, who is your top line uh, spokesperson on the back of your book there, has a great radial view of yeah. measurements through that donut. I know that guys like Phil Lawn have looked at the general genuine progress indicator and your friend Jason Hickel has said, I like a dashboard approach as well. Yeah. Where would the approach with your new economics fit within a, a radiator type thing or, or a single measure like GDP or what, what, what do you think of there? Cause at first it just didn't resonate with me. I didn't understand. Well, fundamentally that we, we, we have to see ourselves as, as exploiting the biosphere. And if we're going to have a sustainable society, we can't do it in a way that damages the biosphere to the point where, where we no longer have a civilization. So uh, in that sense, the, the, the uh, planetary constraints that, that Kate talks about and that we're in a critical part of the limits to growth study, that's the essential starting point. If you don't start there, you're going to end up in a catastrophe. And that's what we've done. We have ended up in a catastrophe. Um, and, and so it, it, we, you have to begin from respecting the biosphere. Economics is a subset of that. Now, that's, that's where I start from. So in that sense, definitely starting with Kate uh, as, as a foundation. And then with Jason's work, what Jason is saying, we have overshot. We do need degrowth. And that's true. Uh, and if you have degrowth, that degrowth can't be something which is imposed on the poor. It has to be imposed on the rich. So one thing I'm working on as well at the same time, uh, too many bloody tasks, but there's a, a guy called Adam Hardy who beat me to the idea of carbon rationing. We have to have a carbon rationing system, uh, both as a prelude, trying to reduce the damage we're doing, but probably also in the future when we when we find you know, categorically we've exceeded planetary boundaries. We have to re restrain consumption while still holding society together. It has to be something that imposes the burden on the rich, not the poor.
You want on the poor, we're going to have the gilets jaunes again and social breakdown will end up in Mad Max world. So that then is saying for the degrowth, we need to take account of distribution, which is so badly skewed in favour of the wealthy right now. So it, it all ties together in, 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 that, in that sense of ecological foundation, respecting the role for energy and, and, uh, and uh, minerals as inputs. We don't have the minerals we need to make that transformation fully and maintain our current living standard. That's some work done by an excellent Australian ge uh, uh, geological engineer that I've met since I wrote the book called Simon Michau. And Simon just says, we simply do not have the minerals to make a transformation from a oil-based, uh, fossil fuel-based to uh, renewable energy-based system. Uh, so degrowth is essential in terms of the actual supply of minerals to do all this. And then ecologically, we have to do it so quickly because the damage we've done from global warming already is starting to cause the breakdown of the climate, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. If this keeps up in 20 years' time, it'll be touch and go as to whether we have agriculture sustainably in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, if we lose the uh, Gulf Stream, for example, which is one feasible outcome, at about a temperature level of two and a half degrees Celsius above where we are now, then the projections of actually an OECD study involving a, led by a, a good friend of mine from the climate world, Tim Lenton, uh, said there'd be a, a catastrophic collapse in the capacity of the Northern Hemisphere to produce, to produce corn and wheat, and just looking at two essential uh, commodities we use. So this is critical stuff. This is not stuff which is uh, our kids have to worry about or our grandkids which is the way the neoclassicals frame it. You know, let's look at 2100. This is 2020 to 2040. So we're right in the middle of it and we have to do something about it. And partly of doing something about it is getting rid of neoclassical economics. Do not let anywhere near policy levers ever again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could not agree with you more. And so no. I guess I guess one more thing here, and I, this is a little tidbit that I didn't know, because I have been on an Australian world tour here of late. <laughs> I had I had Phil Lawn and Stephen Williams, who I understand you wrote a yep. chapter in his new book. Um, mm -hmm. and I would have loved to have had time to talk to you about that, but I did have them on. And folks, it's an expensive book, but it's worth your time. Um, but number two. I had Bill Mitchell come on and we spent some time talking as well. And then right on the heels of that, I had our friend Stephen Hale come on, who will be yep. this Saturday's Macro and Cheese podcast. And so, you know, here I am back again with another friend. Now, I know you're a bit of a world traveler, but you are definitely Aussie all the way. And you're running for the Senate, if I do recall. Talk to That's us wrong. real quickly about your uh, candidacy for that before we uh, head on out of yeah. here. Well, there's a party called the Liberal Party that's the dominant party in Australia, and they're right-wing reactionary now controlled by religious freaks. Uh, that's that's the so-called Liberal Party here. So liberal means arch-reactionary conservative over here. And yet it began with a with a broad foundation like of, of sort of a Humean idea of liberal when it was formed by, by a guy called Robert Menzies about 70 years ago. So uh, a party called the New Liberals came along, so we want to restore the, the genuine progressive sense of the word liberal to the little party and they call themselves the new liberals. They read up on MMT uh, and they then they became aware of my work and Bill Mitchell's work and so on. And they finally asked me to be their primary economic advisor. Then because they saw rising chances of success in the House of Representatives, uh, the leader of the party, a guy called Victor Klein, decided to not run for the Senate which is a proportional representation system where you, there are six candidates elected per state and there's six states in the country. Um, rather than running for that, he'd run for his local House of Representatives seat in North Sydney. And he approached me and said, would you be the Senate candidate? And I basically thought, why not? Why not give it a try? Because as you're aware, you know, we've been trying to get the ears of politicians uh, and failing the neoclassicals just in their ears. They, they think in a neoclassical way. Why not try getting the mouth of a politician instead? get into Senate and I can say what I'm saying now and they're going to be, the media is going to have to report me because I'm going to be that outrageous Senator from that new party. <laughs> but the objective is to get modern monetary theory style thinking, ecologically aware thinking and socially, uh, social class and housing aware thinking into the Senate and up, upset the apple cart. Well, I, I appreciate it. And, and <laughs> I just want to give one more final plug to your book here, folks. Mm. 
If you get a chance, you can pick it up all over the place. It's called The New Economics, a Manifesto by my good friend Steve Keen right here. And please check out his Patreon. Uh, you can get all kinds of good information from it. And Steve, go ahead and let them know how they can find that real yeah, quick. It's www.patreon.com slash Prof Steve Keen, all one word. And uh, like most of the posts, there are free access. You don't have to be a supporter to access the posts. There are some that aren't. That aren't. Uh, of course, I appreciate the support, but what I really, my, my patrons themselves said, we want your ideas out there, so don't make your posts just for subscribers. So that's that's the basis. Subscribe, please. I'd like it because I need the, I, I, <laughs> I need financial support to be able to buy myself a new computer now because my computer broke down yesterday, <laughs> which is why I couldn't demonstrate my Minsky software to you. I'm using my sister's machine and I don't have her fingerprints and it's four o'clock in the morning and I'm not going to go and ask her, hey, Veronica, could you run your finger over the thing so I can install Minsky? So <laughs> life, life was, in, in a sense, heterodox economists have worked on a smell of an oily rag. We've been in low-grade universities or but, but, and, and, and get, never get funding and I'm now doing it with the support of the public, but it's never enough to take on the neoclassical. So Prof Steve Keen at uh, patreon.com, help out there and please... For those who haven't, I couldn't show Minsky here, check out my Minsky software. It's now becoming quite a sophisticated modeling system for those who want to think in dynamic, non-equilibrium monetary terms about capitalism. That's excellent, man. Thank you so much. And really, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. You've taken Zoom calls with me at weird times on a Sunday <laughs> evening, and you wake up early to do a show with me. Steve, you have been the most accessible guy I know. I really appreciate everything that you do you're you're a great guy thank you so much sir and, good again, and uh well Gotta absolutely get together one. well let's have physically get together one of these days eh? i i would like that very much absolutely so absolutely bring our da vinci's anyway <laughs> <laughs> on that cool. note i'm going to get myself back to work this lunch break at the rogue scholar with steve keen thank you so much sir have a great weekend everybody we're out of here <laughs>